Well, I'm going to begin with a, a passage starts in Mark 10, 17. You got Bean joining us. <laughs> oh, hi, Bean. <laughs> Mark 10, 17. And, and my first selection is from an incident recorded in, in the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You have this, this young man who comes to Jesus and asks him, he says, good teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus says, you know the commandments, do them. And the young man says, well, I've always done them. And then um, comes the clincher from Jesus. He says, okay, give away what you have and follow me. Uh, the man, who's, the young man who's wealthy is quite disappointed and he walks away because in order for him to give away what he has, he has to give away a lot. And that's more than he wants to do. Um, he didn't hear what he expected to hear. Now, all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell the same story. But Mark says one thing in that, uh, in his telling of the story, is that one else says one little detail. And I find it a fascinating kind of detail. Mark 10, 17 says, the man ran up to Jesus and knelt before him. That's the detail he adds. The man, the young man ran up to Jesus and knelt before him. The, kneel, the kneeling was probably not an act of worship. It was simply an act of honor and an act of respect. But what I want to center on is the fact that the man ran to Jesus. He didn't walk. He ran. And I've been thinking about that for several weeks. What would it mean to run to Jesus as opposed to just walking to him? You know? um, in, his, in, his, in his running, we see an eagerness. We see a sincerity. He had a question, and he really wanted an answer. And there was excitement in him. There's such an excitement that a slow walk couldn't contain it. A slow walk would take too long. He needed, he wanted to know, sincerely wanted to know the answer to his question. What does I do? The thought for me is, when do I ever go running to Jesus? You know? How eager am I really? Am I really eager? You know, I, I've, been around, I've been around a while, well raised in the faith. I know what's what or think I do. Do I run to him? Uh, or am I confident in some sense I already know what I need to know? Am I, am I perhaps not overly confident that I, know, that I know what it means to live a life in relationship to Jesus, relationship to God? Maybe I think I have all the time in the world. You know, maybe I think I already know the answers. Uh, I already know what it means to, to be in relationship to, to Christ. Maybe the young man thought that too, but if he did, he was quite surprised, quite surprised when he didn't receive the answer he expected. I don't know what he expected. I'm not sure he knew what to expect, but he wasn't expecting that. Uh, we might not like the answer that, that Jesus gives us either. Um, when we ask a true question, we don't really know. If we are asking a really true question, that we, really have a question we really don't know. What he's going to say. But I don't want to focus on being surprised by God's answer. For me, it's his eagerness. It's his eagerness that impressed me. I've been thinking about my own eagerness or lack of it sometimes, not running to him, but only slowly sort of sauntering to him, kind of working my way to him when I get the time, uh, when, when um, <clears throat> you know, I wonder if my taking my time in approaching him is not a sign of something important that is missing in me. That eagerness, that hunger, that excitement, that desire for freshness. Is it a sign of complacency on my part? You know? And I hope that the sight, I'm going to end my thought here now. So I hope that the sight of, of someone running to Jesus will serve as a warning to me that not to take living this faith too complacently, not, not to take it too complacently, that I already know all that I need <coughs> to know. So that's my first uh, thought for the night. Any comments, any questions, any responses here? I looked through a, a few different versions. I looked through NIV and uh, New King James uh, the passion and also the message. Mm. So I looked through all, all four of those and um, throughout that sentence, there's a few different things that, that really 
uh, talks about that longing, I think, the running. Mm -hmm. uh, one version said he cried out, uh -huh. okay. which, which is to me really seeking, wanting to know. Um, and uh, another one says that he fell on his knees didn't kneel before but he fell on his knees so it's like lord lord you know mm -hmm. so i really I, I think you know that does give the essence of what you're talking about running to jesus running after him wanting to know so yeah yeah that, that idea of crying out yeah i i can speak to jesus in very measured very very calm words and terms Crying out is something wholly different, isn't it? I mean, it's just a whole different kind of response. It comes out, that's a response that comes out of the gut. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I approach Jesus with my head. So, so it's good, very good, very good. A lot of times we just run to him when we're in trouble or we have a, a mm -hmm. pressing need. Uh, that's a different kind of running, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's a different kind of running to say I, I'm running to Jesus because I uh, uh, how do I get how do I how do I find you how to find eternal life as opposed to me out of this mess yeah 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 both but both are both are like we but we do but generally we only run to him to get me out of, to get me out of the mess mm -hmm. yeah. No. yeah but what really prompted him to run to the Lord for eternal life that there was something really brewing and bubbling over there that he just couldn't sit with anymore. He really it was he was sincere. I think we have to understand he was very sincere. He really he really wanted to know. Uh, it was important to him. Mm -hmm. uh, like the answer, but it was still important to him. Yeah. Shall we switch gears? Let's move to Rhonda. Okay. Well, I have three verses all together in one topic. I have been, um, so Greg asked us to just come up with um, some verses that kind of have been where we are lately and what we've been thinking about these days. And so I've been, um, I've been diving in a lot into mental health. You guys all know that. And I've been um, really thinking a lot about the ministry of reconciliation. So my verses are from that passage in 2 Corinthians um, 5. Uh, my page here. Uh, verses 17 through 19. And what really kind of got me started Thinking about this in the light of mental health would be, um, I've been watching Dr. Cloud, Dr. Henry Cloud's videos, and he he gives a lot of teaching there. Um, so I'm really excited to see where that's going to go. But that's just really what led me to these verses. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through um, 19 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Um, and I, I just, a new creation in Christ that just, we, we learn more about being saved. We, we think about that a lot. Um, you know, it's funny that ties right into what the rich young ruler was asking how can I be saved? And, and we want our, our loved ones to be saved. And, um, but not a lot of talk is given to being changed. And um, I mean, I know in our church and our tribe, we talk about that quite a bit. I'm just, I'm thinking kind of more in a, a broad sense. Um, we hear more about being saved than being changed, but, but the, we're new creations in Christ. We're not just slap a label on us. Now we're saved. You know, we're in this camp and now we're in this camp. There's, there's so much more that's going on there. And it's a good change. The, the verse says the old is gone. The new has come. There's an exclamation there. This is good. The new has come. Um, 
And so I don't know if you want me to stop there, Greg, or if you want me to just go through all three verses or um, we just talk about you, that for a sec. Well, let's talk about that one for, for, for a second. You made the kind of connection between uh, this idea of, of wanting to be new. We want to be, you say we want to be saved. We want our love to be saved. But being new is a different thing, isn't it? You're saying that's a different thing. It's a, it's a different, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's new. It, um, Dwayne kind of talked about that a little bit last week, um, yeah. actually quite a bit last week about change and how hard it is. And um, sometimes we can't see a way forward and even imagine it being, it's easier to stick with the old than it is to do the hard work of the new. Um, but here it's the new has come. This is good. Yeah. We, yeah, yeah, we, we, we want to be, we want to be new. We want that, uh, as Dwayne talked about it last week, to be, to new, to be a new person, to be, to live in a new way, to, to have new, new habits, and new relationships, and new strengths. We want that, don't we? Uh, um, yeah. Why don't you go ahead, Rhonda? You're kind of on a roll there. <laughs> <laughs> So the next verse, um, all this is from God who reconciled us to, to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And um, at the first part of that verse says, all this is from God. It's not about us working so hard to be new. Um, it's a gift from God and his desire is to to make us new and he does the work. It's not this um, striving. It, there is a lot of work involved, but he is the one that, that accomplishes it when we partner with him. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through God. And this word reconciled um, makes me think of a strength. You know, you, you've got a couple of family members that are estranged from one another. If you think of maybe a, a couple of sisters are estranged, something went wrong and they don't speak anymore. And I think at a, a bottom level, at least in a flawed way, there's still love there. There's still a tie. There's a sense of family but they're estranged and that, that relationship isn't life-giving anymore. Um, and we're, we're estranged from God, even though he loves us. And, and that's not a broken love. He loves us. Um, we're still estranged from him. And it's because of him, he did everything through Christ to that relationship. And um, I, I wrote here that culture is really honed in on the love of God, and they stop there. He loves us. That's enough. And so they sit comfortably in the knowledge of his love and either dismiss or misunderstand his intention in that love is to be reconciled to him to change us, to make us a new creation, all that his love prompted him to do. And I think we miss it too. A lot of times we can point fingers at the culture, but we miss it too. And we sit comfortably in his love and um, we miss being changed and enjoying that reconciliation. That's what I have there in that verse. <laughs> what do you think? People think the uh, the ori yeah. the original okay. see, the original Greek for uh, reconciliation means to mutually change. So it's not just one person making the change, but it's both. It's mm. mutual reconciliation, if you will. 
So I think that's important too, is that, uh, that both parties are making an effort. You know, I was thinking about, you said something Rhonda about, you know, that changes of God and it's not necessarily something that you produce. And I think that's really important to remember in your Christian walk, especially, you know, if you're really intent on spiritual growth and, you know, you take those things you, you, seriously, and you focus on it, you could get to that point where you're like, you know, why am I not developing the way I think I should or whatnot? Uh, but the, at the end of the day, it is of God. He, and he wants you to grow more than you want to grow. He wants his, he wants fruit. You know, John 15 talks about that, that he prunes and trims back. So you grow more fruit. So you bear fruit. And that's always encouraged me thinking about that, that uh, it, the Lord is in control. He wants me to grow more than I wanted to grow for, for his purpose, for his glory. You know, there's purposes for you to grow. Um, new creation is not just for you. There's a purpose behind it because he's going to get glory from it as, as you as you become more like him. So, again, when I think about that, it's just like the pressure is off. The pressure is off right? You're not called to perform. You don't have to do any of that. The pressure's off and, and we just need to keep ourselves in love, you know, fresh. Um, and he, he'll do the rest. It's kind of been my, my walk with God. Nope. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well, can I, okay, good. Go ahead. I just, that made me think when you said the pressure's off, you're free to run to him. Like the rich young ruler, when the pressure's off, when the pressure's on, you're so focused on getting it right and and making sure that that you're reconciled and are you doing it and you're just constantly in evaluation mode. When the pressure's off, you can run to him. No pretense. Who cares? Hmm. That that kind of is a good response to the question I was going to ask Nick. <laughs> So uh, if, you, uh, if, uh, if it's God's going to do the work in us, why is it going so slow? You know, what, and, and, and that again, it, so, so answer that. All right, guys, why, why does he seem to go so slow sometimes? And I think he hit on it, Rhonda. Well, I'm doing that at last week where he's protecting us. We're not ready for all that change. Um, there's a lot of deep work to do. You don't just dig up a plant that's not ready that can't handle the, the mm -hmm. replanting. Um, there's a lot of care there. And he's also, I found in my personal life, don't make a doctrine out of it. <laughs> in my own experience of wanting him to do things and, and seeking him, I've discovered he's way more concerned about who I become than what I receive, than what I do for him, than whatever I accomplish. He's more concerned about who I become. And that is a slow, sometimes very painful process. But when you get to the point where you realize who he is, and what it's going to produce, it's very freeing, even when it's. Yeah, yeah, that's how I, that's how I've always thought about it too. And you gain so much more through that process. You gain so much more re relationship insight in the midst of it. Yeah, when when our perspective begins to narrow a little bit, it, it does become kind of frustrating, especially if you if you've been struggling over certain things for, you know, any amount of time that that could be frustrating but i remember it was like i don't know 12 13 some years ago i was talking with pastor greg once and it was right around the time i started you know questioning my calling and what that might look like and and uh you know i expressed some things to him but i'll never forget what he told me he said nick i think god is putting you on the slow burner and that's what he told me i said slow burner and I've never thought about it that way, uh, but it really brought in my perspective to the bigger picture of what God is doing. 
you know, and it's not just about my, how I function in my calling or hold on a second. (laughs) Just a little parental threatening. So we're back at it. But, um, yeah, I've always thought about that though. Even moving forward is, you know, when, when there's a season where I question or things don't look clear, I just start to wonder, I just start, you know, maybe I'm on the slow burner again. What's Caleb doing out there? Tell Caleb to put his clothes on. <laughs> Who's that, he think he is? is really good. We, we get these candid moments. Hey. <laughs> you don't get that in church, but. Thank you. That's good. Uh, and then my final point there in the kind of the big payoff and all of that reconciliation is he gives us the ministry of reconciliation, that that sense of purpose and meaning to to help others understand his love for them and desire to be reconciled to them as well. And um, that's the mission, the heart behind what we do. It's not finger pointing. You're bad. You need you need, you know, to change. It's God loves you so much. And here's what he has for you. It's amazing. Well, why don't we have uh, Retta? Yeah. Well, one of my <clears throat> favorite verses in the Bible um, is from Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And uh, I've been thinking a lot in the last couple of weeks about waiting. Um, in waiting, there's a lot of impatience. We're impatient about waiting. Um, we're impatient right now for things to open up during this pandemic. Um, we live near train tracks over here and sometimes you're in a hurry to get someplace and you get caught by a train and you have to sit and you have to wait. There's nothing you can do but sit and wait. Um, we're waiting to see our friends again. We're waiting to go to church again. Ah. The past couple of weeks I've been waiting for test results from the doctor which mm-hmm. came back today and good report. So that, that's great. But, it got me thinking about what does it mean to wait on the Lord? Um, like I said, it, it, waiting is a lot of impatience. And, uh, but we know that God wants good things for us. And one of the fruits of the spirit is long suffering, which is showing patience, patience in times of trouble, um, patiently enduring lasting offense or hardship it's not easy it's not easy at all but I was thinking back to childhood and when you had to wait for things when you were a kid it was waiting for Christmas and waiting for your birthday or I remember waiting for my grandmother to come visit and she was supposed to be there from Mississippi at like two o'clock in the afternoon or something and we would sit on the front steps and just wait for them to show up. So I was thinking about waiting when you're a kid. It's like you're anticipating. Um, There's an excitement there. But kind of when we're waiting as adults, there's a lot of impatience there. I mean, you're impatient as a kid, but there's still that stirring. So maybe that's how we should be waiting on the Lord with that anticipation of what he's going to be doing. Um, because he does want the best for us and not waiting in fear of things or waiting impatiently for things, but with that anticipation. Um, We know that he's the one that's in control. And when we don't wait and we do things our own way, we mess up. (laughs) And that a lot. So by waiting, the verse says, he will renew our strength. We won't be weary. We won't faint. Um, And another verse in Psalm says, wait upon the Lord, 
be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. So both of those verses have waiting and strength. So we're going to find the strength in God when we wait on him. And we do it with anticipation and with excitement for what he's going to be doing. That's, that's an interesting thought, waiting with anticipation. Uh, we look upon waiting, as you said, kind of a, oh. Uh, I have to do this. <laughs> or how long is it going to be? But to wait with anticipation, there's a whole different kind of angle on that, isn't it? <clears throat> In Psalms 46, I forgot this one, says in verse 10, be still. Well, when you're still, you're waiting. Be still and know that I am Lord. So just waiting on him is going to strengthen us, give us peace. And that's what I've been thinking about. I, I, I thought of uh, pastor's uh, uh, advice to Nick. Uh, Nick was on a slow burner. But, but it's a slow burner with anticipation, with anticipation of what God's going to do. Uh, yeah, we may be, all of us may be on slow, really slow burners, but with anticipation that God is going to do something. So I think that's an interesting thought. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Today, I, I was telling Tom, I've got, I've got a lot to do on my plate right now. And, and a lot of it, I have to wait for other it's like, I need to do this, but I have to wait for this to happen or for this to come through or to know what yeah. this is going to be. And so I, and I found myself ruminating on everything I had to get done that I was powerless to do and go any farther until something changed. And so um, I came home and kind of, kind of shut this off. So the perspective, it's a perspective to anticipate instead of ruminate <laughs> which is what I found myself doing today the, the um, one the one leads to anxiety and worry and frustration the other leads to uh, strength, and strength and peace and hope and uh, yeah looking ahead yeah really good. looking ahead very positively yeah does impatience come out of uh, a self-centered uh, self-centeredness as we think of all the things that we have to accomplish and how we have to get done and, yeah. and you know and this, yeah. this yeah this thing's whatever it is is standing in my way I have to wait so, so I'm, I'm really worried about the worry too right I think a lot. Anyway, sorry that's okay go ahead I'm a great one for making I think lesson plans for so many years you have to get this part of done and you have to get this part done and stay on the schedule so lately I've kind of lessened up on the list making instead of I've got to do this this and this today I've not noticed that by the way that she's lessened up <laughs> <laughs> lists, oh, they look okay. different oh. now <laughs> but she's not making one for herself she might be making one for you <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> Switch gears. Just wait. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> With anticipation. <laughs> Good. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll go to my next one. And I'm going to re return again to Mark 17, or Mark 10, verse 17. I want to return that story again of the well-to-do well young man who ran, who ran to Jesus with a question. Um, before that story really gets going, though, uh, before we, re we really get to the, what we call the real point of the story, which is uh, forsaking on following Christ, Jesus asks the young man a question. Remember what? The young man approaches Jesus, and he calls him good teacher, which is a, a word of respect. It's good rabbi. It's a word of honor. Uh, uh, he, he's doing the right thing. He's being respectful. And Jesus says, uh, ask in return, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. That's how Jesus responds to him. And then after having doing this quick response, he then goes on to answer the young man's question. It's as if his comment about only God is good is kind of a, a passing, kind of a passing line. And he gets on to what we, we often think is the meat of the story. But I think Jesus' question to the young man, why do you call me good? Kind of loaded 
with many possibilities of interpretation. But I think at a basic level, Jesus is asking the young man to reflect on the words he's using so casually. You know, he used the word good so casually. And, and, and I mean, good is a word of respect. It's a word of honor. But I think Jesus is asking to think about what does he mean when he when he uses the word good. What do you, what do you what do you why do you say uh, I'm good? You know why do you say that? In you know James says <clears throat> that or, I'm sorry. Jesus says it applies only to God and what it comes from God. That's his response to the young man. He says the word good applies only to God and what comes from God. James says every good gift. Every good gift comes from the Father, right? That's what James says. Um, these words that we hear, we know they're true. But it's so easy, isn't it, to take those good things in life for granted, um, to forget the source from which they come. Uh, it, it's, it's real easy for me to slip into thinking that the good things in life, um, they come from my own good efforts, or they come from the fact that my parents uh, gave me and taught me a, a good work ethic. Or maybe it simply becomes because I deserve them, or the good things life is because I live in a nation where good things happen. You know, I'm, we, it, it's um, maybe I, I say good things happen to me because of good luck. We do that. Good luck, you know. And I don't wish to discount uh, how I was raised or where I was born. Um, I might wish to discount good luck. Um, you know, I, I think. Uh, Good luck simply means we don't know why the ball bounced our way when it did. Uh, we don't know why the good things happened to us. Um, but anyway, I think too often I take, I thoughtlessly take the good things I have for granted. I just take them for granted. I, I think Jesus is asking the young man to think seriously about what is truly good and where it comes from. When he asks the young man to do so, he's also asking me to do so, of course. Uh, do I pay enough attention to the good things that I have? Do I appreciate sufficiently the goodness of God? Do I use the word good casually? Um, I came across this passage. Uh, uh, it says, the sun shines and warms and lights us, and we have no curiosity to know why this is so. But we ask the reason of all evil. We ask the reason of why there is pain, why there is hunger, and why there are mosquitoes. <laughs> You know, we, we don't really, we don't really, we say uh, good things come from God, but it, but it doesn't, it, it, it's not, a, it doesn't grab us. But when bad things happen, that really grabs us. And we say, why? We don't ask why good things happen. We ask why bad things happen. Um, on the last day of creation, God said that it's all very good. Um, his goodness to me continues. I uh, never want to lose sight of that. I, I, I do not want to lose sight of how good I have it, so to speak. And um, to lose sight of that thing is to slip into a kind of ingratitude. And I hope this doesn't happen. So I've been thinking about that a lot. You know, I do. Uh, yes, I say to myself, good things come from God, and I believe that. But it's when bad things happen that I really ask why. Why? Why did why did the things happen? I don't ask I don't ask why good things happen with the same urgency, do I? Yeah, and that and that just struck me that I uh, I'm much more yeah my 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 uh, I'm much more engaged with the question of why bad things happen than I am with the question of why good things happen. So anyway, that's just a, something I've been thinking about. I didn't know he was going to use that verse or the that part I was thinking of the goodness of the Lord too this week and my one of my other verses was Psalms 33 5 the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord and I've been outside a lot in the last couple of weeks um, and things like that and you do take for granted all the things that God has made and, and has done. And I looked around and our, our yard is full of birds. And we have uh, blue yellow finches, gold finches. We've got robins, of course. All these different birds. The other day we were sitting on the porch and there was a hummingbird there. 
and you just look at it and you marvel. And uh, we were out at the farm today, a little picnic for our anniversary, and Greg saw a goldfinch. And we were talking about um, all the different species of flowers, and we we're just seeing a little bit of it. But just think, God made all of this. And he made less than a week for us to enjoy, and we don't. So it's kind of a mission to open my eyes and pay more attention, and especially now that we're not running around and doing so much, just pay more attention to the things of God, to the little things. Does that look like the one you're talking about? I love it. I, I love that. They'll be walking with that for a while and just why the good Lord then? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, you're right. The bad news does grip us, right? That's when we call our friends and our family or, you know, we salt. We do all sorts of different things with bad news. But with good news, we, we don't call people about good news as, as often. It doesn't grasp, grab our attention and our, our mental space like, like bad news does. But you're right, that leads to ingratitude. Uh, that really does. But when you capture the good, you know, you expand your perspective again and you, you start seeing some of the bigger picture too. So that, that's, a, that's a really good thought. I'm going to have to think about that. I, I wonder if it, it goes back to that kind of self-centeredness or entitlement mm -hmm. um, because we, like, do we expect that we should get good things, but when something bad happens, it's like, oh, how could this happen to me? It's almost like, like an entitlement that we have that, well, we should have all these good things. We shouldn't have bad things happen. So I don't know. Kind of a little self-centeredness, maybe that's that's why we ask why did this bad thing happen instead of why did this good thing happen. I, I like that word entitlement. Uh, both in the way you use it. it means you talk to one another. It's not both use the same word entitlement. I think there is something to that, isn't it? That we it's our right somehow for everything for good things to happen. It's a good word, entitlement. Which is very self-centered, isn't it? It's very self-centered. Yeah. It's like it's almost like we're selfish, and that we expect the good stuff, and when something bad, it's like that takes away from us. So I don't. Know, that that's kind of how I'm. Uh, you know, self-centeredness and all that, you know, it's, it's almost like we're being selfish and we should, and we expect just the good. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, how are we doing on time-wise here, Rhonda? I mean, we kind of. Yeah, we're, we're kind of wrapping it up at 6.43. Okay. Let me, let me just do one more if I, if I could real quick here. Um, this comes from Psalm 16 and Psalm 16 verses eight and nine. And, and when, whenever the, you translate the Psalms, there are lots of different ways of translating it. So this is the one that I've been using and this is what it says. Psalm 16 verses eight and nine. It says, I am ever mindful of the Lord's presence. He is at my right hand. I shall never be shaken. So my heart rejoices, my whole being exults, and my body rests secure. You know, I've turned this kind of Psalm 16 in this portion of it into kind of a prayer. And my prayer works like this. It says, addressing God, of course, it says, you are near. You are at my side, and I am not troubled. Because of you, because of you all that is within me is it up. Body and rest in confidence. I think we all know that, uh, you know, bottom line with God is cultivating this sense of God's presence in our life. We know that. Um, 
Emmanuel means what? God, God is with us. That's what Emmanuel means. And the Gospel of Matthew ends with those words, I am with you always. I will be with you always. And, and we know that. In fact, in fact, Psalm 139 says you can't get away from it even if you try. It says if you, you go to the farthest point of the earth, try to get away from him. Try. And you can't do it. You can't succeed. You can't hide from him. Um, and what happens when we do? What ha- you know? What happens when we get away from him? In the sense of, in the sense of, of we we're not attending to him anymore. That's when we get troubled. That's when we get anxious. That's when we get nervous. That's when we get afraid. That's when we lose our confidence. Mm-hmm. The psalmist says, "I am ever mindful. I am ever mindful of your presence." King James puts it this way: uh, "I have set the Lord always before me." I. I have set the Lord always before me. Another translation says, I keep I. Him. In a way, this is something I must do. I must be the one who, who, you know, God is always present. God is really always present. It's that I must give attention to him in order to realize that in my life. He is always present. For whatever reason, God, you know, doesn't treat us like a child. You know, you, you when you're when you're a child, your your parent takes you by the chin because you're not listening, and he looks, they stare you in the face and say, "Listen to me, listen to me." Usually, God doesn't do that. He can do that, but that's not the normal way in which He does it. We have to take our journey with, with God seriously, and seriously making means making ourselves making ourselves aware of his presence. Um, we are responsible for what we will tend to, aren't we? We are responsible. It is our decision. Yeah, it's what we choose to see and pay attention to that matters. And so we are responsible for attention to God or lack of it. It, it rests with us, that responsibility. I, I heard an interview, an interview with the late uh, Dallas Willard, and it says that every morning he would open his day Welcoming God into his presence. Good morning. Good morning, Lord. Good morning, God. He would greet the same way. He would greet God the same way he would meet. He would greet anyone else in the morning. You know, um, God was had not been absent. Dallas Willard had been sleeping. And he woke up. And when he woke up, he said, good morning. God had, was never not there. God was never somewhere else. God was never outside waiting to come in. God was always there. It was it was it was really that had to turn his attention to God and say, Good morning, welcome, welcome. You are near, and I know that. I'm never mindful of your presence. So Willard made a decision. He made a decision to be ever mindful of God's presence. Again, there are negative consequences for not doing so. We find ourselves on our own. Um, it is easy to be shaken, it's easy to be shaken. Uh, by whatever happens to us. It's so easy to doubt. It's so easier to get angry. It's so easy to get down in the dumps uh, when we are not attending to him. And um, uh, when I'm ever mindful of God's presence, I can be confident. I can be, I can rejoice. I can be joyful. My soul and my body can rest secure. I can have a sense of confidence. I can have a sense of security in God when I am attending to him. Because I know that he's always attending to me. So um, I think Psalm, uh, that particular passage in Psalm reminds me that I am the one. I am the one. That is my responsibility. I have to set him before me. I have to keep him continually before me. And it's my decision. To do that. Okay. That's, that's my thought. Um, Any other comments? Okay. I'll, I'll never, I'll never be able to say good morning again now. I won't be able to say good morning again now without going. Where's the goodness come from? Ah. <laughs> and I had not thought of that. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, we say that's a good point. We say good morning. We use that word again. Totally thoughtlessly almost, isn't it? It's like a oh, oh. Yeah. Any good. Yeah. Yeah. So now because <laughs> God is with us, but yeah. we don't. Yeah. Good point. Good. Good. 
Anything else? I, I love that emphasis that it really is us. I wrote it in my Bible as you were speaking. It's something I must do. I must do. Um, the Lord isn't before me just by chance. And uh, it is something I have to tune into. Um, I have to set the Lord before my eyes. And other things will come across my vision and, and across my path throughout the day, but I have to set the Lord before my eyes. And, um, well, are we going to close this in? <laughs> I think if nobody else has any more comments, I think we can go ahead and close it down. I. I love the putting a scripture out there and a thought and then discussing it. Um, and uh, it's just really good to see you all. And we're going to Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, we'll be at the church for a drive-in service. Um, so more details will be rolling out on you know social media and email. And if you have any questions, Feel free to call the church. Um, Tracy is fielding those calls. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all there. We can. Uh, we are encouraging folks, if you want to bring a camp chair, it's supposed to be nice. You can put your camp chair by your car. Um, you just have to stay near enough to your car to be able to hear your radio because there won't be speakers blasting the sound. It'll only be coming through radio, so. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, they have. So thank you, Greg and Retta. And Good yeah. job, guys. Great yeah. job. Greens oh. tonight, Nick, out there in the camper. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah wish us luck. <laughs> Go to Caleb. Go to see Caleb. Yes. <laughs> What's that? No, it's okay. <laughs> so, all right. Well, good all right, night. We'll see you Sunday. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Bye.